Welcome to Discovering. I'm tagging along on a DNR fish survey off the shores of Lake Michigan's Garden Peninsula. We get information on age and growth, uh, how successfully the fish reproduce that year, walleye and perch, because we get good samples of their young. And we'll stop in at North Haven Gifts on Drummond Island for a look at pudding stones. Stick around, it's Monday night and time for Discovery. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure, the only way I measure. Feelings that I have for this fine land, there is so much to discover. When you're a long time lover of Northern Michigan. Whether we fish or not, we all have an interest in seeing a healthy fish population in our waters big and small. Making decisions on how to best maintain and manage that resource requires current and precise information. I hopped in a boat with DNR fish research biologist Troy Zorn and fisheries technician Jeremiah Blau for a look at some hands-on information gathering in Big Beatty Knock. So what we're gonna do, we put the gillnet tub on the front of the bow. We separate our catch by um, three sizes of mesh. So we have a, the smaller meshes, the medium mesh, and the large mesh, and the micro mesh. This is the micro mesh right here. Depending on how the perch reproduction is really good, they'll will load up. Often catch alewife in this or spot tail shiners. What's that? Smelt. Well, a couple more smelt looks like. It's being used to look at effects of cormorant control in the perch population. They track uh, expansion and changes in the Eurasian rough population, which they're established in Little Bay to Knock. Uh, we've got someone that's doing genetics work on smallmouth bass, we're getting genetic samples. And this year we're collaborating with uh, Wisconsin DNR and Uni University of Wisconsin Stevens Point and doing a walleye movement study. So we'll be putting radio transmitters in walleye so they can track their movement throughout Green Bay. So that's it for the micro mesh. This is the first time I think we've netted this location so we didn't really know what we were gonna catch here. And so we have seven buckets and we sort the fish out as we go through each of the mesh sizes so we can get um, catch by mesh size. We typically look at just the overall catch per net and take an average across all the sites to get a picture of what the bay looks like this year. Sort them out and then we'll measure the fish and um, get our aging structures. Walleyes would do a diet and sex on those. Perch, we also would sex those because there's, for both those species, there's pretty distinct differences in how well they grow um, based upon the sex. So you wanna know what the sex of the fish is to get a good picture of growth. So this is just kind of an all-purpose survey. We used it for indexing walleye reproductive success and we do our walleye population modeling from the data we collect, track the forage fish populations. Um, each of the nets is two 320 foot nets tied together. They have mesh sizes that range from one inch to five inch stretch mesh. They're monofilament mesh. Um, so we catch all different types of species. We also have a, a two 10 foot pieces of a very small mesh gill net on the end. And that's for our index of young uh, yellow perch reproductive success each year and it does a really nice job at catching the two and a half inch perch which are the ones that were produced this year and so we have 40 foot panels 40 foot long by six feet high of each of those different mesh sizes it's a monofilament so it's hard to see in the water and the way it works is a fish basically swims into it and gets gets tangled by its scales or hard parts on its body and they just can't get loose from it Quagga mussels, that's what most dominant mussel in the lake nowadays, it seems like. It's probably more than 95% of what we'll see in our nets and when we're trawling. When we get any mussels, it's, we get the quaggas. We set it yesterday at around noon, so it's fished 24 hours. 
and they all fish right on the bottom. So this is fishing at about 40, you know, 40 feet. The gillants may catch more fish in the evening when it's the light is a little bit darker and it's even harder for them to see it. But I'm not exactly sure when the when that's most effective, but I could imagine that. Uh, well, this is a perch. The perch that are dead, we want to get the sex on those, and we got to, you got to cut them open to do that. Hill life, four five. And because we're in, you know, you can see we're in a pretty small boat, and the weather can change out here. We just find it's more efficient when we get these kind of fish to just um, note where they're from. So we write on a card here the collection number, which associates it with this net, twenty one forty five, and the medium mesh, and then we just bag them throw them in a cooler, and then when we get back to the shop, we can, in the comfort of our lab, process all these fish, you know, get the aging off them, because we've got to cut them open and get the sex information off of them, and we do the diet on the walleye, so. And we can do that all in the lab. It's generally safer to not spend a lot of time out on a big body of water like this in a small boat. It's okay to do it for a while, but if the weather's gonna change, then it's really good to just be able to get off as quick as possible. And it's, it's just more awkward doing it out here on the water, so. 23-0? Yep. The perch and walleyes that are alive, we just measure those and toss them. Over the course of the survey, we usually catch enough dead ones. We want uh, 20 or 30 fish in each inch group. And over the course, course of the survey, we'll get enough dead ones of all these different sizes that we'll, we'll release all the live ones we can. All the Chinook being stocked in the Lake Michigan, other parts of the lakes too, have an adipose clip. See how this, this is a brown trout. That's the adipose fin, the little fleshy fin. So all the ones stocked in the Great Lakes have an adipose clip, and the ones that are stocked also, they clip them, and then they insert the coated wire tag in, in their snout here. And the tag is, it's smaller than a grain of rice. And so all the fish that have that clip, we want to save them, and then we send the fish down to Charlevoix, and they extract that tag, and then they can tell where that fish was planted, and and then they'll know what portion of the planted fish reco are recovered, you know, where they are recovered from, so where they moved to. And I think they could probably even get to something like how well they survived, you know, what portion of them survived from the time that they were tagged to the time that they were recovered, you know, by comparing um, amongst years. So we, we save these uh, adipose clips. We got to take this, we'll take it back to the the lab and whack its head off and then send the head down to Charlevoix. We did our first net here at 46 feet. We got another one set here. I need to steer the boat. That's B100. That's also at about 40 feet. And then our last one is in here at about 15 feet. And so we'll run, once we run those, then we'll reset at three locations out in this area. We'll probably catch more in the shallows. I bet we'll get more smallmouth and rock bass. But this part of the bay, I think we catch maybe fewer fish than on the other side of the bay. But it's really quite variable from year to year. First thing we'll do here is get a secchi depth, which gives us a picture of water clarity. Um, it's kind of a coarse measurement, but we've seen very dramatic changes in water clarity since mussels have moved in. It relates to walleye movement and behavior and how the fishery has changed. Also, it relates to uh, how the um, plankton community has changed and declines in uh, forage fish and basically the overall productivity of the northern part of the bay for walleyes. And um, so we've seen definite declines due to those changes. We go 23 feet. 23? Yep. Okay. So this is part of a standard uh, fall assessment survey that we've been doing in Green Bay since 2009. There was, there has been long-term assessment happening in um, Big and Little Bay to Knox since 1988, which would be gill net survey, but it didn't use very much um, net and it wasn't very reliable for trend analysis. So we, uh, expanded our, our program out to get a really uh, good handle on 
um, how the fish community is changing in these areas. So we set nets at uh, randomly selected locations in Big and Little Bay Nock each year, and then in alternate years we sample um, Cedar River and Menominee, and then that's in the odd numbered years, so this year we will. And then even numbered years we're also sampling at Nobinoy and Manistique. I have 118 sites in Big Bay Nock, and we randomly select uh, 24 of them each year for the survey. And then we randomly select another 24 in Little Bay. So this, this is the first day we've lifted nets this fall. It, it takes our, we have a crew from our office and also the, the Northern Lake Michigan Management Unit. We generally run two crews when we're doing the bays to knock and it takes two weeks to get the survey done. Some scale. We're working with the uh, University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point. They're doing a genetic study of smallmouth bass in Green Bay, mostly southern Green Bay, but they're including um, big bait knocks are looking at the kind of relatedness of the different stocks and I think movement between the stocks. And then we take the anal spines and age the fish from a cross section of the anal spines. Kind of like people age them with scales where they lay down different rings, but on the spines you can see the ring a little bit more clearly. It's a one ring per year. It's not the easiest structure to age, but it's, it's doable. It's, it's better than the scales, more reliable is the consensus. Yeah, the first two nets, first one was at about 44 feet and the next one at about 38 feet. This is our shallower set of the day. It's about uh, 13 feet right here. I think it gets to about 18 at the deeper end. So it'll be interesting to see what we catch. Um, the first net didn't have a whole lot of fish, but the second one had quite a few perch. Which, so we'll see how this one works out. We used to use a trawl. Well, we still do trawl, but uh, I think with the changes in water clarity, I don't know if our trawling is as efficient as it used to be for collecting young perch. And this micro mesh, it fishes overnight and we fish it everywhere we set our net so we get a much better picture of perch reproduction around the bay. Oh yeah, he's, he's, he's lively still, yeah. Uh, we should process him right away. Bring him in. We'll measure him up. What you got? Uh, looks like about 32 one. 32 one? Okay. okay. And that's it, eh? Yeah, we're done with them. See the adipose on this one? That's a naturally produced Chinook. And he was 24.9. CHS 24.9 fin clips, head of AD, scales. Wow, he looks like he's not too alive, huh? We should take over this off that one. Should we just take him back with us then? Yeah. Because uh, they've done some work in Wisconsin, actually, the same guys that we're working with on this telemetry project. And they found that some of the smallmouth grow quite a bit, they're, <laughs> they end up getting quite a bit older than what you would expect from the scales of the spines and from aging the otoliths, which are the ear stones of the fish, they found that some of these fish are approaching 20 years old and the typical aging from a spine or a scale ends at about, they'd say that fish might be about 9 or 10. So, so since this one died, we're going we're gonna to take it back and we're going to take the otoliths. The otoliths are right behind the eye. We'll do that back in the shop where we're not bouncing around on a boat. This survey ends up getting used for a variety of purposes. Um, uh, you know, in, in addition to indexing the trends through time in the forage fish, the game fish populations, we get information on age and growth, uh, how successfully the fish reproduce that year, walleye and perch, because we get good samples of their young. Um, there's cormorant control happening in the area. Has happened, is happening, I'm not sure of the current status, but We've been using the data from the perch survey to keep track of how the population is responding or if it's responding at all. The walleye recruitment information is used to help us guide how much more we should stock, if we should stock, those types of questions. In Little Bay Knock, we catch Eurasian Rough. I think it's the only location in Lake Michigan where they've been catching them. And they're just hanging on. It's been a small population, but it hasn't really taken off. 
We'll be doing some acoustic telemetry work, looking at walleye movements. This fall, so we'll be implanting receivers or tags in those fish so we can track their movements. And um, we're also working with uh, uh, someone at the University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point, who's interested in smallmouth bass genetics. And they're looking at populations in southern Green Bay and comparing them also with um, the population out in Big Bay of the Knox. So we're also looking at diets of walleye and how they change and how that relates to the forage fish population and um, other things like that. Uh, you know, the data gets used for a variety of purposes over the years. Just a few examples. Well, we've got our three nuts run. Now we're resetting at the next set of sight. So this first one is uh, 25 feet deep or so, and then we've got another one just further down closer to the point. That'll probably be uh, 15 to 20 some feet, and then we'll have one further out. Um, in the bay that's going to be at about 50 feet, I'm guessing. Generally, because we got a small boat and the weather out here can be iffy, we generally set the uh, nets in a downwind direction. Well, sometimes we will um, set them parallel to the break, so we're getting the fish in the same depth contour. Today we're setting the nets, these couple nets, parallel to the contour because tomorrow we're supposed to have a pretty good west wind, and so we, it's a lot better to pull them into the wind, at least with our setup here. And uh, plus, we'd be if we started at our point, we'd be running up the contour, which would could be problems for us. So. recent trip to Drummond Island, we ran across a unique looking rock, which turned out to be a pudding stone. When the English were here on the island, they used these stones, they would empty their ballast stones out of their boats and put these stones in to take back and sell in England. And it was like their, their suet puddings. What's a pudding stone? We made a quick stop at North Haven Gifts on the island to find out. What I have here in my hands is a pudding stone or a quartz jasper conglomerate. They were named by the British or at least that's the story in about 1815 on St. Joseph Island and the British believe they looked like a looked like boiled suet pudding with berries so that's how they get their name this is what they classify as a white one locally okay this one here is a black one or a goganda tiliite it's called a black pudding stone or even a white pudding stone or pudding stones they're just names that somebody invented the official name is goganda tiliite and this one here the white one is a quartz jasper conglomerate. Here at North Haven Gifts, we make all kinds of stuff from um, putting stone. Night lights, we make bookends, door pulls, coasters, trivets. We make all kinds of jewelry. This is a prototype piece. It's done with sterling silver. This knife that you see right here, the steel was made in Colorado. We're only the stone people. The stone is from putting stone. We make these in both white and black. The sheath's made by an Amish gentleman in Flint, Michigan. A trapper folding knife, two-bladed folding knife. We make five different kinds of folding knives. We make six different kinds of hunting knives, fixed blades. We make crosses, we make hearts. This is one of the things that my wife does that is kind of unique. See how the bale is finished here? See how the rock is in her lane? This is a prototype piece she just made. Pudding stones and, and Goganda tiliites um, were made in the time of the glaciers, okay? And exactly when they were made, how many millions of years ago, I'm not sure. But geologists tell me, and I've had many of them here, that a Goganda tiliite is about a million years older than a quartz jasper conglomerate or white pudding stone, and it's about 12 times more rare. So the Goganda, most people don't realize the difference, but it's actually a more rare rock. Inside of a, a quartz jasper conglomerate, of course the quartz, these white areas, 
are quartz. These red areas are jasper, and they're a level seven hardness, making this rock extremely hard to cut. I mean, like a Toski stone is like a level 0.2.5, just to give you an idea. Granite's like level four. So this is a very hard rock. Also, these dark areas, some geologists tell me they're chert, okay? And chert is what the Native Americans use to make arrowheads, spearheads, axe handles, all that kind of stuff in this part of the world. The Ojibwe and the Cream used it. Now, normally, chert is found on its own in bigger pieces. Also, in conglomerates, you can find silver, gold, diamonds, copper, granite, other things. When, they, when the glaciers were formed, whatever area they rolled through, whatever riverbeds they picked up from to form this is what ended up in them. Pudding stones have a quite large range. According to the Canadian government, and they're more uh, in tune to this than we are, the range is about 150 miles wide. It extends to about 40 miles north of us. And you can find pudding stones clear to like Cadillac, Michigan. Most of them, when you get beyond Sheboygan, Charlevoix area, go down into the earth, and the, they're, they're found in farmer's fields where the earth slowly rises them. Here on Drummond Island and in St. Joseph Island, if you can think of it as an epicenter to an earthquake, is where the most of them were. So we're, according to the Canadian government, Drummond and St. Joseph Island, which is our neighbor just to the north on the Canadian border, um, is where most of the pudding stone was found. We also use all kinds of Great Lakes stones. Anything in the Great Lakes region we use here. Chrysocolla, Fayette Purple, Leland Blue, Petoskey Stone, Lake Superior Agate. But just to show you some of the other things that my wife does. These are, this is here is a double strand. We call them Great Lakes Pearls. They're, be, they're beads made from Jasper and Quartz Jasper conglomerate or pudding stone. We also make things like rosaries. This is just an example of a rosary. All made out of pudding stone. We make all kinds of jewelry. We make money clips, we make belt buckles, cufflinks, uh, bracelets, watches. The list goes on and on and on. If you can make it out of rock, we're doing it. Well, that's it for tonight. If you'd like to keep tabs on what's coming up on Discovering or see where we've been, go to 906outdoors.com. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week right here on Discovering. As he roams the hills and fields, call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill, the eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure, the only way I measure, feelings that I have for this fine land. There is so much to discover when you're a long-time lover of northern Michigan. Micromesh. This is the micromesh right here. Depending on how the perch reproduction is really good, they'll will load up. Often catch alewife in this or spot tail shiners. What's that? Smelt. Smelt. A couple more smelt looks like. It's being used to look at effects of cormorant control in the perch population. They track uh, expansion and changes in the Eurasian rough population, which they're established in Little Bay to Knock. Uh, we've got someone that's doing genetics work on smallmouth bass. We're getting genetic samples. And this year we're collaborating with uh, Wisconsin DNR and Uni University of Wisconsin Stevens Point and doing a walleye movement study. So we'll be putting radio transmitters in walleye so they can track their movement. Whether we fish or not, we all have an interest in seeing a healthy fish population in our waters big and small. Making decisions on how to best maintain and manage that resource requires current and precise information. I hopped in a boat with DNR fishery research biologist Troy Zorn and fisheries technician Jeremiah Blau for a look at some hands-on information gathering in Big Beatty Knock. So what we're going to do, we put the gillnet tub on the front of the bow. We separate our catch by um, three sizes of mesh. So we have a, the smaller meshes, the medium mesh, and the large mesh. And the Welcome to Discovering. I'm tagging along on a DNR fish survey off the shores of Lake Michigan's Garden Peninsula. We get information on age and growth, uh, how successfully the fish reproduce that year, walleye and perch, because we get 
good samples of their young. And we'll stop in at North Haven Gifts on Drummond Island for a look at Pudding Stones. Stick around, it's Monday night and time for discovery. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence throughout Green Bay. So that's it for the micromesh. This is the first time I think we've netted this location, so we didn't really know what we were going to catch here. And so we have seven buckets, and we sort the fish out as we go through each of the mesh sizes so we can get um, catch by mesh size. We typically look at just the overall catch per net and take an average across all the sites to get a picture of what the bay looks like this year. Sort them out, and then we'll measure the fish and um, get our aging structures. Walleyes would do a diet and sex on those. Perch, we also would sex those because there's... For both those species, there's pretty distinct differences in how well they grow um, based upon the sex. So you want to know what the sex of the fish is to get a good picture of growth. So this is just kind of an all 